Hey everybody, sorry about the delay today. Happy Friday, welcome to my Facebook Live, how to read your low back MRI. Um, if you've tuned in with us before, uh, we've talked a lot about the spine lately. We've been talking about um, some various different conditions, including disc bulges and arthritis and stenosis or narrowing of where the nerves are traveling. We've talked about slippage of the vertebral bodies, the bones moving um, and causing various issues in the low back. Um, but the thing that I wanted to go over today is um, your low back MRI, because quite frankly, I think there's a lot of people um, that uh, get MRIs and, and oftentimes look at the reports and see a lot of different words um, that, that quite frankly may or may not be serious may or may not be absolutely normal, um, but some of these words um, sound scary, um, they're big, and when we look at them online, and we, we, we Google what these words mean, they, they can actually end up being a little bit um, daunting. So for that, for that reason, I wanted to um, you know, go over what your lumbar MRI is like um, and explain some, whoa, whoa, I did not mean to do that. Um, explain what some of um, the words are that you may see and kind of go over what exactly this looks like on imaging. Um, so, there we go. I don't know what was happening there. Um, so, um, I'm going to go over some anatomy here. Um, this picture here is a side view of the spine. Um, this is the low back and what we see is, well, the way that I describe it to patients oftentimes, especially when I'm doing telemedicine on the phone, is that the, the spine is like a stack of coffee mugs on top of each other. And if you tuned in with any of my previous uh, uh, discussions, um, I've oftentimes described it as that. Um, but what exactly does that mean? So I'm gonna kind of just draw over uh, this, this spine here and show you that, that these are the coffee mugs that I'm talking about here. So this is the mug, um, and this is kind of the, the handle that we see back here, right? If you can picture that. Coffee mug, coffee mug, right, handle, and here are the discs, which are the water balloons in between the coffee mugs. Now this is a three-dimensional picture, or it's a, the spine is a three-dimensional thing that is now placed in a two-dimensional model here. Um, so we have to understand that this is a slice that's in the middle of our spine. This is the front of the body, this is the back of the body, and this is the top, this is the bottom. So front, back, top, bottom, right? And basically um, this slice or this cross section that you see here is right in the middle of our body. So um, what does that look like? I'm gonna draw a little man here, ba -ba 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 -ba, right? And here's a torso. And here are your legs down here. So we're talking about your low back, which is in this area. And if we think about what this slice is, it's a three-dimensional slice that's right in the middle of the body. I don't know if that makes any sense, but there you go. Um, now, when we look at the anatomy here, there's several things that we see. We see the vertebral bodies, the bones, as I discussed. Um, these squares are the vertebral bodies, and here are the discs in between. Back here are, I said they're the handles, but ultimately these are the spinous processes. So these are the nubbins that we feel when we press the back of our spine. On either side, we have what are called the facet joints, and we'll be able to see that in another picture that I put up. But we don't see that right now, again, because the cut is in the middle of our body. What we do see here in the center is this white area here called the central canal. 
This central canal up here contains the spinal cord, which is this structure right here. And then all of these lines that we see traveling here are the nerves that are traveling all the way down through this central canal, and they're going to be exiting on either side of our spine. We don't see where they're exiting, again, because this is a cut right in the middle of the spine, and we don't see where they're exiting on either side, but we'll show that on another picture. Um, there's some other structures that I wanna point out. Now I mentioned that this is the vertebral body, the bone, right? And these are the discs. There is this black line that we see going across here. That is called the posterior longitudinal ligament. That is a strong ligament that connects the back of the vertebral bodies and borders the back of the discs in these areas. Similarly, we have this black line in the front of the body called the anterior longitudinal ligament. And again, this is a long ligament that connects the front of the vertebral bodies and borders the front of the discs. I'm gonna get back into why that's important um, shortly. Now in the back here, where we have our spinous processes, we have these lines that are connecting the spinous processes together here in the front. And this line represents what's called the ligamentum flavum, which is a thick ligament that borders the back of the spinal canal and connects the bones together from level to level. In between each of the spinous processes, you have what are called the interspinous ligaments. The interspinous ligaments connect in between each of these spinous processes. And then this thick black line that we see over here that's sitting almost on top of the spinous processes is what's called your supraspinous ligament. And that is a thick ligament that connects all of the nubbins of your spine together, so all of the spinous processes together. And that supraspinous ligament is actually continuous from your sacrum or the base of your spine all the way through the lumbar spine, through the upper back and thoracic spine, all the way to the neck. It's contiguous or continuous with a thick ligament called the ligamentum nuchae that goes all the way to the skull. Similarly, the ligamentum flavum is essentially continuous. The posterior longitudinal ligament is essentially continuous. And the anterior longitudinal is essentially continuous all the way from the base of your spine all the way up to your neck and your skull. Okay? So what we described here were these lines that go up and down are all of your strong ligaments in the midline of the spine that are connecting all of your bones together. Um, and just to recap, the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament also do border the discs in front and behind. Okay? And again, we'll get back to why that's important. Um, Another few things that I want to point out here is I want to point out what the discs actually look like. The discs here, you can see, um, have this kind of darker rim and have a lighter inside. And you can see that there's actually this black line that's here and a black line that's there. In actuality, I oftentimes describe this as a water balloon that's completely filled with jelly. But in actuality, it's like it's a um, balloon with multiple layers of rubber and then the jelly on the inside. Okay? And those multiple layers of rubber are called the annulus fibrosis. The jelly on the inside is called the nucleus pulposus. 
And you can see that a little bit clearer when you look at the vertebral body, the bone, or the, the disc right there. In actuality, the disc actually has that balloon, but it also is comprised of the top and bottom of the disc, which is kind of continuous with the vertebral bodies of the bone. So in actuality, think of it as a, a sandwich, right? It's kind of like a sandwich in which you have what are called the end plates are your buns and the jelly balloon is your hamburger meat or whatever, right? Um, so in the future, when I talk about pathology or issues that are associated with the spine, we'll go through some things called modic changes, which are signs of potential degeneration or inflammation in the disc that's involving what looks like the vertebral body on either side of the disc, but is actually a part of the disc itself. Um, in this model here, um, in this picture here, I wanna point out that the discs you can see are fairly white on the inside here. Right. You can see that this one here is starting to get a little bit of um, dark in it. And this one all the way up here has a little bit of dark in it throughout. Um, the, in this sequence, which is called a T2 weighted sequence, liquid is bright. So the fat in the epidural space here, sorry, the cerebrospinal fluid here that's that's surrounding the nerves is bright white and the fluid inside the nucleus pulposus or inside the disc is also bright white as we get older and you've heard me say this over the ripe old age of 20 or 30 we all start getting disc degeneration and ultimately what that means is that there ends up being less water inside the water balloon so that balloon starts to get more dehydrated or degenerated. And that ends up being a darker signal inside the disc, and eventually that disc starts to collapse downwards. Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to point out in this image here is where we see disc bulges. So for all intents and purposes, this is what a normal lumbar spine MRI looks like. But when you look at the vertebral body here, the back border of the vertebral body here, and you look at the disc here, you can see that it's ever so gently bulging outwards beyond the border of the back end of the vertebral body. We'd have to look at this from multiple views, but this may be a sign that there's a little tiny bit of a bulging of that disc going on, it's hard to say. But a larger disc bulge would essentially look like it's coming out further than the vertebral body, or a disc herniation or a disc extrusion may look even bigger than that. A sequestration is when a piece of that disc actually dollops outwards and separates off from uh, the major disc right there. But in this, again, we see that the discs are pretty uniform, maybe a little bit of broad-based disc protrusion at each of these levels. We can't say, we actually, I can't say that it's a broad-based protrusion because we can't see three-dimensionally what that looks like, but we can see that there may be some bulging that's occurring there. Um, let's see, what else do I want to point out here? Um, the spinal canal, right? We oftentimes think of the spinal canal as containing the spinal cord, um, but in actuality, in the lumbar spine or the low back, the majority of the spinal canal actually does not contain the spinal cord. The spinal cord is this over here that typically ends around the L1, L2 region. So let me stop there. Um, I probably should have mentioned this before, but what is this L1, L2, L3 business going on? Well, the lumbar spine is comprised of five segments typically. 
five, four, three, two, and one. And since it's the lumbar spine, they're referred to as L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Below the lumbar spine is your sacrum, so S, and the sacrum is actually a fused group of vertebral bodies. So this would be considered S1, this is S2, and below. Since the S sacrum is fused, it has the remnants of a disc right there, but in actuality, in actuality that's not a real disc for all intents and purposes. The, the lowest disc in the low back is the L5 S1 disc between the lumbar and sacrum, sacral regions. The discs are named for the vertebral bodies above and below them. So this disc is L1-2, this disc is L2-3, L3-4, L4-5, and L5-S1, as I mentioned before. Um, there is such a thing as um, transitional anatomy that you may read in your reports. Transitional segments or transitional anatomy refers to the fact that there's a small percentage of patients um, that actually have an extra lumbar segment or have their last lumbar segment um, partially fused to the sacrum. So it's acting like S1. Or they even have S1 that's partially unfused and acting like L5. So this happens uh, anywhere between 10 and 20% of uh, patients, and it's actually relatively common and is not necessarily associated with um, injuries, um, but can contribute to a change in biomechanics. But for all intents and purposes, is not something that we need to be worried about when we see that on your MRI, unless your physician thinks that's a part of the picture. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to mention in terms of the normal anatomy when we look at the spine over here. Um, I wanted to pull up, if I can, um, uh, some images that are more off to the side here. So let me see what I can look up on our friend Google real quick. I'm going to show you now. Uh, now, I mentioned before that the picture that we were looking at first was smack in the center of our spine. Now, this picture here is actually off to the side. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, the holes in which the nerves exit on either side called our foramina. And each of these foramen um, are these holes here, these white circles that we see. And the nerves are actually these black or gray dots that we see here. And again, when we look at the vertebral body here, here is your kind of coffee mug that we're looking at. And these are the discs in between. So the hole here is in between the disc and the front, and actually where the coffee mug handles come and touch, which are called our facet joints. So a more clear view of the facet joint can be seen all the way down here between L5 and S1. When we look at how these handles come and touch one another and this space in between these two bones touching is what's called your facet joint. It's also, more, more correctly, it's called your zygophyseal joint or Z joint, and the facets really refer to the piece of the bone that touches the other piece of the bone. But kind of common uh, terminology, that's ref this is referred to as the facet joint. Technically, that's incorrect, but that's what I call it. And in between the facet joint and the discs, again, is the hole where the nerves exit. Um, 
really conveniently, this arrow is pointing exactly to that hole. And that hole can get narrow when we have a disc bulge. It can get narrow if the facet is getting arthritic and getting bigger. And that can cause narrowing of where the nerve is traveling, which can cause what's called foraminal stenosis, right? The hole is called the foramen. Stenosis refers to narrowing, and that can be referred to as foraminal stenosis. Okay. Um, so you can get a view of what arthritis looks like at those joints if you see that there's some irregularities that are taking place there. Um, but next, I want to take a look at a different view of the spine. And this is what's called an axial view. So when we see an axial view here, what this ultimately means is now we're laying down on our back. And the cross sections, the cuts, um, are actually um, uh, parallel to the ground if we were standing on the ground. Okay, So again, kind of showing my little my little person model here. Here's your person, right? And this is kind of three-dimensional here. So this is the cross-sectional plane that we're looking at. Um, and this is a person that is laying down on your back and your head is past the screen your feet are towards you. So this is actually the right side of your body. This is the left side of your body. This is your front and this is your back. Okay. Now, this picture here, if you look at this kidney bean shaped structure, this kidney bean shaped structure is actually your disc. And this is a nice healthy disc because we see the black annulus fibrosis, which is essentially all of the layers of the rubber balloon, and your whiter, nicely hydrated nucleus pulposus. Okay. So this is essentially the disc. These are the facet joints on either side, where one bone meets another bone. And if you look at them, kind of funny, if you look at them sideways right here, it kind of looks like a hamburger sideways, right? That's what a normal facet joint looks like, okay? Um, this is the spinous process. So again, this is the nubbin that we feel on the back of our spine. On either side here, we have our paraspinal muscles and our erecti spinae muscle groups. So this all this black is muscle. And here specifically are what are called the multifidi or multifidus muscles, which are the small little stabilizer muscles that go through one or two segments of, of spine at a time. Over here you have your psoas muscles, um, which are actually your hip flexors that start in the spine and go to the front of your um, uh, legs and are in, in charge of hip flexion or bringing your knee to your chest, so to speak. These are your blood vessels here in the front of the spine. And back here is the central canal where the white is the fluid and these gray dots are the nerves that are going to be exiting out each side. So I'm going to make this a little bit clearer since I scribbled a lot. These are the nerves that are going to be exiting on either side. Okay. Um, I mentioned before ligament structures. This kind of thick black line here and thick black line here. Well, those are the ligamentum flavum that I discussed, which is that thick ligament that uh, connects your spinous processes together, the back, the front end of the spinous process together, and borders the front of the central canal here. And you have this ligament that sits right here, which is your posterior longitudinal ligament as well. 
So there are various different things that can cause stenosis or narrowing of where the nerves travel in the center here. If you have a disc bulge, right, that's coming out, can narrow the space here. If the bone is getting arthritic, and if this bone is getting larger, that can also narrow the space in this central canal. And if there's thickening of this ligament here, if that ligament is loosening and kinking on itself and thickening, then that can also cause narrowing of this central canal where all the nerves are traveling. Now, going back to these muscles back here, you see how these muscles are black and there's a little bit of this white that's starting to form right here, right? That white is a little bit of tiny, tiny little bit of muscle atrophy. Muscle atrophy re refers to when the muscles are not working appropriately and the muscles start getting uh, changing into fat or getting replaced by fat. Now you see these little white lines that are going through in various different places. Well, these white lines are actually the little bit of fat that falls alongside um, different nerves and different vessels that go through the different areas. But when you start to see some increased white in an area that's really close to the spinous process, well, that's what's called atrophy of the multifidus muscles. Now that can be perfectly normal as we get older, very common for that to occur. However, um, if we have that occurring and, and we see that it's actually more asymmetric, meaning that it's occurring more on one side versus the other, then that could be a sign of nerve irritation more on one side or the other. Because when we start to get that muscle atrophy that's more asymmetric, that means that the nerves are not sending the right signals to the muscle, and then the muscle is starting to die back more on one side versus the other. Very commonly seen with radiculopathy or irritation to the nerves in the low back. Um, and then finally, when we look in this area here, uh, we can see where we have foraminal stenosis potentially, um, but we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily diagnose foraminal stenosis. Um, this would be the region of the foramen or the hole in which the nerve is exiting. And we can see if there's a big old disc bulge that's out to the side here, we can get a hint that that area is being narrowed. Another area where we can see narrowing, so we could see narrowing in the central canal here, we could see narrowing out where the nerve is exiting, but we can also see narrowing of what's called the subarticular region or the, the area below um, where the, the joint or articulation is. In that subarticular region, if there's a disc bulge that's right there, well, not necessarily the nerve that's exiting at that area, but the nerve that's traveling right past that region and is going to exit at the level below this particular segment, well, that nerve could be getting irritated there. So at the L4-5 disc level, for example, at that level, the L4 nerve is exiting but the L5 nerve is going right past that region and can be getting irritated in this subarticular area. Um, and that's pretty much all that I wanted to talk about in this region. Um, you know, with this view, we can get a good view of the disc, we can get a good view of the central canal, um, and if there's stenosis, we can get a good view of the facet joints to see if there's arthritis going on in those facet joints. And we can certainly get a good view of the multifidus muscles from this viewpoint as well. Um, and between this view and this view, the sagittal view, um, we can get a great understanding of an overall picture of what your lumbar spine is looking like. So in today's video I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page in regards to what normal anatomy looked like as far as the lumbar spine is concerned. I think it's super important for us to know what normal looks like in order for us to know what abnormal looks like. Um, 
Now the reality is that abnormalities occur in everybody as we get older. Um, I've said this ad nauseum in the past, over the age of 20 or 30, um, we all start getting various different types of degenerative changes in our spine. We start getting disc degeneration, we start getting disc bulges. We could even start getting things like disc tears. We can certainly start getting things like arthritis or wear and tear of the joints. Um, we can get looseness of the ligaments, we can get atrophy of the muscles, and all of these can be absolutely normal. But when are these things that we see on the imaging, when are these words that we read on the MRI reports, when are these just normal abnormalities, um, or when are these actual abnormalities that are contributing to your condition? That's when we have to marry the appropriate imaging with the appropriate physical examination and history learning about what's going on putting all that information together to see all right what is and is not contributing to the condition that's how we determine what's the pain generator what's the thing that's causing the pain in the spine but also determine what are the other factors that are involved what are the other components of the functional spinal unit that are contributing that are coming together to actually irritate the thing that's the pain generator right? and it's only by treating that whole functional spinal unit by addressing the loose ligaments by strengthening them by strengthening the muscles by addressing the arthritic joints by by addressing the disc bulges by calming down nerve irritation by getting nerves to fire properly it's by addressing all pieces of the functional spinal unit that we can get the best benefit um, and by using your own body's orthobiologic solutions, we can oftentimes address multiple components of the functional spinal unit um, all in one setting to get the most optimal results. Um, but first and foremost, we got to know what's going on in your spine. And that's where, a, a, again, the physical examination and a thorough, thorough evaluation of your imaging ends up being so important. Um, it's not just important to read the MRI reports. It's very, very important for the clinician to also look at the pictures um, because radiologists are human too and, and errors do occur. But more importantly, radiologists are trained, are attuned to look at and to diagnose if there are A, red flags that are jumping out at you, things like you know cancer and things like tumors and things like you know, uh, blood vessel issues and various different things that, that need to be addressed. But also, too, to look at, you know, are there things that need surgery or need an intervention? Um, and, and most radiologists will look at that and, and address all of those abnormalities um, in the report, but may not address some subtle findings like the multifidus muscle atrophy or like looseness to certain ligaments that may actually be contributing to the issue um, as a part of the whole functional spinal unit. So it ends up being critical that we don't only look at the report, but we also look at the imaging. And, and for patients, it's good to look at the report, and it's good to look over the imaging with your physician. So if you have imaging done, I think it's important for you to look at your imaging with the physician and go over things, ask questions. Um, be an advocate for yourself and learn about what's going on in your body. But it's also important when you read the report and when you, you know, inevitably go on Google searching for things for you to not freak out because there is oftentimes words that can be daunting, can be scary, um, but quite frankly might not necessarily be a part of a condition or may not be that serious at all. So I hope this was helpful for you all. Um, I hope you were able to learn a little bit about um, what normal spine anatomy looks like on MRI. Uh, next week, I'm going to go and start going through some abnormalities in uh, lumbar MRI. Um, and then we're going to go on to looking at other parts of the spine like your neck. Um, so I'm just going to look at, I have a, a comment here from Carol. Uh, excellent. Thank you for this. No, uh, you're welcome. I hope this was beneficial for you. Um, if you did find this beneficial, uh, Carol, and for everybody else listening, if you did find this beneficial, please share it. Please like it. 
um, you know, uh, spread the knowledge. I think it's so important for us to know exactly what's going on in our body. So please uh, share this to everybody that you know and love and, and even those that you hate because even they deserve to know what's going on in their bodies. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. If you have any other questions, concerns, drop me a comment. Um, you can drop me a DM. You can contact us at info at fxregencenter.com. Um, and hope you all have a great rest of your Friday, a happy weekend, and I will see you next week.